Well, good morning and welcome to our study on Thursday, December 15th. And we're going to begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are very grateful for the time that we have each morning and for this morning uh, that we can come together, that we can open your word, and that we can receive light from you. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can instruct us, correct us, and reprove us. We ask, Lord, that you can convict us of our sins, that we can move from sin to righteousness to judgment. We pray for each person here. You know all of the needs that we have. And we just ask that you can bless each one. Be with us now in this study. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> So um, yesterday, at the end of our study, we were discussing the, the chiastic structure of chapter 13 of Judges. And we were dealing a bit with, um, well, a number of things. We were dealing with the fields. We were dealing with the 115 years, which if multiplied by the 20 geras, gives us 2520. And that's giving us this message of Nashville that was given Ellen White in 1905, and that was um, repeated in 2020 with the July 18, 2020 prediction. One correction. Yeah. The 115 multiplied by 20 giras gives us 2300, not 2520. Yeah. 2300, yes. <clears throat> okay. There. Uh, for some reason, I was looking at... Uh, you know, at the 2020, and I was thinking 2520. Right. Know. Yeah, it's 2300, as it says right there. Um, so, so we have this um, uh, symbol, and we have the 2520, of course, from the 126 shekels in Daniel right. chapter, which is multiplied by the 20 gears. Now, um, so part of this in understanding this structure had to do with this, well, we were discussing the field because the woman's in the field. She runs for her husband. Now he's going to uh, run for her uh, when the angel comes down again. So there's some things about the structure uh, that we need to look at and understanding what, uh, um, particularly, um, a chiastic structure. So this would be what we call a literary chiasm, uh, such as found in um, the Song of Solomon. It's written in a chiastic structure. So uh, everything leads up to the marriage, which is the center. And everything leading up to the marriage is sunny and roses. And after the marriage, everything is uh, the opposite. And, it, and it's written in a uh, a mere structure. So things at the beginning are at the end and that it works its way to the center, to the marriage. Um, I don't know if that's Solomon's statement upon marriage as much as it's a, a statement upon a God's relationship with Israel um, and, and their transgressions, but also it's, it's about Solomon's own life as well. So I'm, I'm pretty sure Solomon intentionally wrote the Song of Solomon in that way. He understood that he was using a literary chiasm. So that's what you're suggesting here then, Dwight, is a literary chiasm, correct? I would say so. Yeah. Now we had as the center verse, of course, we have some, some numerical significance because this is chapter 13 and the center verse is verse 13. So 13, 13, the center and, um, but we don't find that we get a complete uh, chiastic structure as far as the field is concerned, um, at least in my assessment of it. Um, so I, I didn't try like drawing this out, but if we could, we look at this, we, we have the birth of Samson. This is what the chapter is about. It's sort of the preamble to his birth, it leads up to his birth. And 
we have this 40 years at the beginning, which is noted. Now, I also had suggested that this was um, representative of 9-11 to 20, uh, wait, no, not this one. Um, yeah, this is part of 9-11, but this is going to go to verse 25. And so it's it's not going to be like chapter two, which goes from one to 23, but we're still going to have 9-11 at the beginning. So I was taking that this verse one represents 9-11. And that um, and we saw this in, in other ones as well. It wasn't this one. Um, can't remember now what I was thinking. So anyway, here we have 9-11 represented at the beginning, and we were starting to draw up the lines, and we could see relationships um, with some of the numbers, like the 318 or 1318 being the reverse of 813 of the Palmoni. Uh, we also had then uh, 1318, and this is also Pal Palmoni because uh, he asked after the name of the angel of the Lord, and the angel of the Lord says unto him, why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? Now we had the name earlier in it. So one of the ways you would deal with the literary chiasm is you would take um, your nouns or actions or verbs or things that are referenced in some way, and you would draw them out and try to see where your structure is, which things are repeated. Um, we know that the directions that are given are repeated. Um, and so when we go back to the beginning, and I hope I'm not going too fast. If I'm going too fast for people, uh, you can ask for clarification. Right. So when um, in verse four, now, therefore, beware, I pray thee, drink not wine nor strong drink and eat not any unclean thing. And. This is then the promise given of this son who's going to be a Nazarite from the womb. And the woman tells her husband and mentions that he didn't tell me his name. He didn't tell me where he was from and, and he didn't tell me his name. And then she says, uh, she repeats again in verse seven, what was said to her. And then Manoah is going to entreat the Lord, and he's going to ask about this, right? Um, and then the woman is going to, um, she's sitting in the field when this angel comes to her again. But Manoah is not with her. The woman makes haste, and she goes to her husband. He says he's appeared. Then Manoah gets up. So there's, there's, so one thing we can look at is the actions. You can look at the nouns and I don't know if we should try drawing this out. Maybe it would be a good idea, but you can look at the different actions or directions that things happen. So Manoah arises, he goes after the woman. So this is what uh, Dwight had noted. Um, but of course this comes before verse 13, which is the center verse. And then after, uh, this center verse, again, the directions regarding the woman are repeated. And then, um, and then we're going to address the name, right? So we can see that those, those things are mirrored. And, and then we're going to have this offering. And uh, so here we're going to have the angel of the Lord ascend in a flame of the altar. Um, and, and then they're going to, um, and then Samson is going to be born, right? So basically they, they talk about what had happened. And then she's going to bear Samson. And it says the spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtol. So how should we approach this? Should we try to draw this on a line in a literary chiasm first? I think we've found benefit from being able to draw some of these things out. Okay. So we're gonna need some help here as far as doing this. 
um, I'm going to go to the whiteboard. And so what we need to do is we need to take the words there. So I can't really see my computer when I'm standing at the whiteboard, can't read these verses. Um, so we're going to have to just kind of draw these out, uh, these words and actions, so nouns and verbs, names, etc. Um, this reminds me of when, when I was first studying the 2520, <clears throat> when I was first studying the 2520 and I had a study at Kelly's place. And what we did was um, we drew all the, wrote out all the verb, all the nouns in Leviticus 26 and all the nouns in Daniel chapter four. And that was pretty enlightening as far as seeing of the similarities between those chapters, the seven times, etc. Okay, so what do we have at the beginning here? Um, so I'm just going to draw this list first going down. Maybe I'll draw a line up here, but I won't put everything on the line yet. So we have a list. What, what do we have? What's the first verb? Delivered. Okay, so the Lord delivered them. Okay, so delivered. For 40 years. Yeah. And, and maybe what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put verbs and nouns. Now, nouns can also be pronouns and, and names and things like that. So we're going to put the Lord here. Uh, we also have um, 40 years. Okay. Then what do we have? Children of Israel. COI. Okay. Um, okay. Well, we'll leave that out. I just don't think. Okay. Yeah, but what about Philistines? Okay. So you're going to have, yeah, that's going to be included in the 40 years. Because this is just 40 years of Philistine oppression. Right. Children of Israel is implied here. Okay. <clears throat> Now, if we looked at the alternate reading from the Hebrew. Yeah. The children of Israel added to commit evil. Added to commit evil. Yeah, did evil. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm not going to put that in there. All right. I mean, I, I, yeah, so. Because it's definitely an action. It's a verb. Or it's a, a statement yeah. of a verb. So here, what I would put, this is punishment for oppression. Or, or punishment for uh, evil. How's okay. that? Fine. So well, that's really badly drawn. I mean, we can't write all, too many words here. We would just won't, we'll run into problems. So the main, main verbs and actions. So we're going to have, um, we're going to have Manoah, but what is Manoah uh, doing? What's going to happen? Is there any action of Manoah yet? He has a barren no. wife. Just barren wife. Okay. Then the angel of the Lord appears to her. Yeah. So, so I'm going to put this up here. I'm going to have. Um, okay. So 40 years for the Philistines and then the Lord. And he appeared. Okay. And and then he's going to give directions, right? Right. So um, does he give directions first or does he give a promise first?
Okay, well, we'll just put this as part of the same thing. Fine. Okay. Um, okay, so what else do we have? So he's going to give these directions. And then the woman is going to tell her husband. Right? Um, so In 13.6... She came and told her husband. So, yes. And so this is um, the woman, the husband. Right, so that's the direction there, right? Okay. Okay. Now. Manoah hears, but he entreats the Lord. Okay. So remember, we're not we're not really doing a um like an interpretation of any of this in doing this. We're just trying to uh so so what we have here in Manoah is going to entreat. Right. So there's an entreaty made. And what's the next thing? Well, <clears throat> so because then we're going to have a feel, right? Okay. I've, I've got something odd. I'm just, I'm going to ask this. Now we understand that we have been looking at different visions in different parts of the Bible. Mm hmm. We have the calzone, we have the mara, and we have the mare, right? Yeah. So when the wife is giving the description of the countenance of the angel of God, mm -hmm. she uses mare. Yeah, that's in verse six. Okay. So here again, we have the Mare vision. Okay. So we need to put this, uh, and and which what's the verse say? Because I can't see it. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, "A man of God came unto me, and his countenance, his Mare." Okay. was like the mare of an angel of God. Okay. Um, now, even though the angel of the Lord appeared, his countenance, I'm just going to put this here, which is a mare. Now, I don't know what you mean, mare, mara. So which right. one? What, what is it, that? One? That's like the mirror. Okay. The three visions that we have within scripture. Yeah, I, I yeah, but I, I know you get it. But the tie in is that the Mare vision is the Arab and Boker, the 2300. Okay, so that's what I wanted to know. Yeah, so this is the 2300 days you're saying. Correct. Yeah, okay. 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 So <clears throat> then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, Oh, my Lord, let the man of God, which thou did send, come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. And then in 13 9, and God hearkened unto the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field, but Manoah, her husband, was not with her. Yeah, okay. So and what then, do we want to do here? Well, nothing. She's in the field. She's going to make haste and go to her husband. And, and, then, and, and then we're going to have a rose, Manoah. 
right? Which is the next thing. So he's going to go after his wife. So the woman made haste and ran and showed, <clears throat> showed her husband <coughs> and said unto him, Behold, the man hath appeared unto me that came unto me the other day. Now, what was she showing him? Well, uh, she's telling him. It's not visual. Right. All right. Okay, so. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said unto him, Art thou the man that spakest unto the woman? And he said, I am. So we're going to have an ask. And we're going to have an I am. Yeah, we have a query and then we have the I am. Can that yeah. be Manoah to his wife, not just woman, instead of woman? Doesn't matter. She's a woman. Yeah, I understand. But... It says woman in the Bible, but anyway. Okay. Now we get to 1313. Or right. excuse me. We get to 1312. And Manoah said, now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child and how shall we do unto him? Okay. The, alternate, the alternate of that would be, now let thy words come to pass. And what shall be the manner of the child and what shall be his work? Yeah. Um, yeah, so you asked about... A child, well, this would be over here, a child would work. And this is again another question. Okay, and then we have the center verse, which is And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. Okay, so that's going to be the center. So the center is this warning. Okay, now, um, so in the other part, we're going to have verbs and nouns. Okay, so what are we going to have next? <clears throat> next, we get the description of the warning. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink nor eat any unclean thing, all that I com commanded her, let her observe. Okay. So how do we characterize this? What's the verb? Well. The command? The command. commands and any particular nouns here vine wine strong drink yeah so unclean thing okay, so unclean okay And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we shall have made ready a kid for thee. Well, <clears throat> we have detain and then made ready, don't we? Aren't those both actions? Yeah. But, but I'm not putting made ready because it's not really. Um, okay. It's not something that's going to be irrelevant uh, in in any mere way. Okay. And so he's going to detain the angel. He attempts. Yeah. 
but the point is that's what's the that's the noun here. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. And if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. Okay. So, um, so what, what's happening here? What's He's declining to be detained or declining the food. Yeah. See, and then in that first part, we missed the part about the name. Where, where does that happen? Which name? When it talks about it, he didn't tell me his name. This is going to be here, hey? Um, well. I just, we forgot that somehow. We skipped over that. No, we were, we were addressing the countenance. I know, but that's still not. Um, the name is is at the end of that same portion that deals deals with the countenance, with the vision. Yeah, but she comes and tells her husband that he didn't tell me his name. Correct. That's yeah. part of that same statement. I, I know, but we didn't write name in there. All right. We didn't write that. Does not tell the name. Okay. So you're saying uh, that doesn't make sense. The countenance is that's where she says up at the, the second thing that we wrote. <clears throat> when I interrupted that, the countenance, as, as the verse is written, then the woman came and told her husband, saying, Which verse? Of God, Which verse? 13, 6. Okay. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God, very terrible. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told me his name. Now, okay. your so situation. Up here then. Is what I'm saying. Where does the Mara happen? The Mara is the countenance. So that's here then? No. You had it right the first time. But this isn't verse 6. Punishment for evil. You were right because it's occurring before the Nazarite directions. So this is up here? Okay. Or in between the two. Okay. Well, let, let me take a look here. Yeah, so we got a little bit missing in there, missing there. So yeah, so that's going to be down here. Um, so this, uh, and then also the promise of the sun. Um, so we need to put that in here. And we get a sun. And, and in here, we're going to have that Mara, right? So does that help?
what I was looking at out of verse six mm -hmm. before the Nazarite directions is that countenance is repeated twice. Okay, so we have the Nazarite directions here. We have the Nazarite directions again. Right. We have the first Nazareth. What I'm saying is that the, the situation on the countenance and neither told me his name uh -huh. uh, comes just before the first Nazarite directions. Okay. Because that's 13.6. The Nazarite directions are 13.7. They're also... It had, it had to be the second angel's message, wouldn't it? Okay, so the Nazarite directions are in verse four and five, right? What? Yeah, so what I'm talking about, I, I'm using the Nazarite directions here. Right. In Point taken. Five. Yeah, so they're repeated. Okay, so yes, I agree there. William, yes, I would say this is the second angel's message as well. Okay, so why? Because they're repeated. Well, you've got the re you've got the repeat, but I'm also applying this with the countenance because when we go into this with the Mare vision, as we're as I just said that we're looking at the vision of the Arab and Boker. Okay, so I'm gonna do this again because I'm not happy with what we did. Okay. okay, so we need to be a bit clear. So we're gonna have these verses, let's do it this way. Five, six, seven, So we're going to have up to 12 verses. I don't know if we can get that all on there, but we're going to have 12 verses here. And we're going to do it verse by verse. So sentence by sentence. So So let, let's break it down sort of in sentence structure. You got a noun and a verb. So you're going to have, let's let's even do it this, this way. You're going to have uh, the subject, the verb, and the object. How's that? Make sense? So if we go to the first verse... What's the subject? I mean, we're going to have actually a couple of subjects and objects because there's basically uh, two two phrases, right? But... Because because if you break it down in this sort of sentence way, I know this is a little bit you know English um, grammar, but. Okay, the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines 40 years. Okay, so how would we deal with what is the subject? The subject is... Isn't the subject the action of the Lord? Well, an action isn't a subject. That's going to be the verb. All right. Right, so they're going to... Uh, would it be the Philistines? What's that? Would it be the Philistines as a subject, right? Or is it not? No, Philistines are now. Okay. Um, well, yeah, they can be a subject or an object, but they're they're neither in this case. Right. So the subject here is the, the children of Israel and their sins, right? Right. And they're going to be so the object is going to be, um, if you wanted to use the noun, the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. So we'll just put here 40 years. Right. 
So they're going to be delivered, which is not a good thing. And this is going to be the children of Israel. Okay. Now, the one who does the action is the Lord. Right? Okay. So, um, you know, I don't know if I, there's, there's a lot going on here, right? So the Lord is going to deliver. In this case, the Lord is the one who does the delivering. Right. Right. And he's going to deliver the children of Israel. So probably a better way to look at this is the subject is the Lord. What I first said. Yeah. He's going to deliver the children of Israel to 40 years in uh, oppression. Does that okay. make that, That's better, right? I would have to say so. We're going to use the word delivered. So the subject is the one who does the action. And it's going to be done to the children of Israel. Not putting 40 years there, but that's just symbolizing the children of Israel being oppressed for 40 years. Because, I mean, it, it, there's different ways of looking at this. I don't know. I'm not great at this kind of stuff. But... Um, the subject is the one who does the action, right? The children of Israel do evil, so they have an action as well. So, I mean, we could break this down with the children of Israel did evil. But we're going to just look at the whole sentence. This is about God delivering the children of Israel into Philistine, into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years, right? Now, in the next part, um, we don't really have, uh, you know, it's not as simple as this one in the sense of, so there's, it names this person. So we got this man of Zora and the, and the woman. So, so this is going to be the subject. So it's not really verse two. It's kind of verse two and three. No. Mm -hmm. We have to break this in for verse two, because verse three says that the angel of Lord appeared unto the woman. Right. So this is the subject is Manoah and his wife. Right. Man and woman. Yeah. So that, that's just naming the subject in verse two. Doesn't say what ends up happening to them. There's sub phrases, right? It, but it's just describing the subject. Okay. Right. In, in this case. So, so what it's going to do is it's just going to name um, Manoa and wife, and it's going to describe them, but it doesn't doesn't have an action regarding them. And then the angel of the Lord is appears unto the woman. Okay. And said be, uh, unto her, Behold, now thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. So, um, so basically we're going to have, uh, the Lord is going to say, the angel of the Lord is going to appear unto the woman, right? So, I mean, we're not going to break each of these phrases down and put subject and object. The base, basic idea here is that um, he says, right? So we would say the angel of the Lord. So we're going to have Christ speaks to the woman, right? And here in this case, this is going to be about a son. So, so the woman is going to bear a son, right? So, but that's, that's the idea here. Okay. Okay. Now, yeah. In the fourth, now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. So Christ provides an admonition. He yeah. provides instruction.
Yeah. So, so Christ admonishes uh, the woman, right? Right. Okay. Okay, then. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Okay, so again, he's going to, this is going to be the giving of the Nazarite vow. Right? Nazarite instruction, yes. Yeah, the Nazarite instructions. So, um, yeah, this doesn't always work in this subject for object. Um, uh, but we could say that, right, that is going to be the object. Right. And instructs. How's that? Okay. Regarding the Nazarite vow. And again, that's going to be the sun, and that's just a repeat. So we would not name this one and two. Okay, makes sense. Okay. All right. Now, verse six. The one that I'm causing all the trouble with. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance, his mare, was like the mare of an angel of God, very terrible. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told me his name. Okay. So here, again, you're going to have the wife, right? And she's going to tell her husband. And this is going to be about the angel, and which is a mare, and no name. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. But why is it important that was noted that she didn't ask whence he was? Yeah, well, I'm putting that in there. So she didn't she didn't ask where he was from or his name. Okay. Right. So we noted that before, but that, that's sort of tied up in this. We're just going to leave it there. I'm not going to write because, because I don't see that mirrored later other than, you know, he, he goes to heaven. So, I mean, we, we end up knowing his name, it's secret and we know where he's from. So that's going to be answered later. Okay. Um, in, in the second part, it's going to answer to that problem. Okay. Okay. And then verse seven. But he said unto me, behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son. And now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. So this is going to repeat it. Um, the third time. Right. Okay. So, so the woman is just going to repeat what she, um, so how should we write this out? Well, subject would be the woman. Okay. Yeah. So the wife or woman repeats okay, so this instruction. Is... Okay, yeah, we'll just say instruction. Okay. It's the object that's the thing being repeated. Uh... Okay. We're not really doing our grammar properly, but anyway, it's good enough. <laughs> Theodore, can I ask a question? Yeah. Would this would this be like the first, second, and third angel's message? 
But we, we already established that, didn't we? Oh, okay, okay. I just right. I just thank you to myself. I apologize. Yeah. Yeah. So what he's saying here is this is going to be the third time, right? All right, let's let's make sure we've counted this. Okay. Is this the third time? Or is it the second time? Look at this carefully. Yeah, it's the third time. Okay. All right. Right, you can see that. Okay, we've got it. Okay. Now, verse eight. Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O oh my Lord, let the man of God which thou didst send come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. Okay, so he's Manoach is now asking. Yeah, asking for instruction. Right. Yeah. Okay. And the Lord hearkened unto the voice of Manoah. So the Lord listened to Manoah. And the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. How's that? Okay. You wrote angel. Yeah. Harkin. Harkins. Yeah. And, and comes or whatever. Okay. But he's the angel is hearkening to Manoach, not to the woman. Yeah. He, I know. Okay. All right. He hearkens to Manoah and he comes to the woman. Okay. But the angel hearkens. Right? That's what he's doing. He's the subject. He's going to hear and he's going to come and he's going to go to the woman in the field. Yeah, I know. We're not, we're not dealing but isn't with perfect grammar. So don't worry about that. It's just what's being, it's implied. He's hearkening to Manoah because Manoah is the one ask, asking, but he's going to also come to the woman in the field. So we need that woman in the field there. Would you agree with that? Well, I'm seeing two separate actions. Exactly. So I don't I don't want to write out two lines. <laughs> I'm just okay. including it all in one line. Okay. So he hearkens to Manoah and then he's going to go to the woman. So the angel does two different actions. So the hearkening okay. is to Manoah, the coming is to the woman in the field. Okay, so it's just a short shortcut there, right? I don't want to write too much. Okay, you satisfied? No, never no. satisfied. <laughs> okay, well, you're going to have to be. Um, no, and the woman made haste and ran and showed her husband. Yeah. So here we have three actions. And said unto him, Behold, the man hath appeared unto me that came unto me the other day. Mm -hmm. So by making haste, running, and showing, is this also not what we were just asking about being the three, the three angels' message? Okay, so if you're going to say the making haste and the running and the showing represents the three angels' messages, how would you parallel that? Because I think it's correct, but I just want you to. Well, 
the showing is the first angel, the running is the second angel, and the making haste is the third angel. Wouldn't you do it the other way around? You can. I would do it. The I was looking at it. I was looking at it in reverse because you. Well, you may be right. I'll I'll leave it there. Go. Because the, the three angels' message is a three-step, the everlasting gospel, prophetic testing yeah. message. Yeah, that um, develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers, right? And the showing here. Um, It means to stand out boldly, uh, uh, stand boldly out opposite, to manifest, to announce, always by word of mouth, one presence, specifically to expose, predict, explain, praise. Um, so to me, this would be the demonstration, but... Um, Well, isn't there a fourth action that is implied but not written out? Okay. What's that? Well, by implication, she said, Behold the man that hath appeared unto me that came unto me the other day. Isn't she confirming that Christ has appeared to her again? Mm-hmm. So you would have then first, second, third angel's message plus the message of Revelation 18. Yeah. So, well, I would just say the showed is, is the confirmed. That's what confirmed would be implied in, in the definition of showed. All right. All right. And that's why I say that's the third, because that's the demonstration. So I don't I don't um, see the fourth in this one. Can can I make a, a comment? Mm -hmm. Of course. So um, I I'm looking at verse three, and so this is like the first angel's message, right? This is how we're we're looking at that, mm -hmm. and then we go to um, verse. Let's see why it tells has been. Uh, so seven, uh, I'm sorry, nine is the, the second angel's message, right? No. Okay. Is, is that what, cause you know, you had made a comment about this, uh, verse nine and you said that there was two things that was inside of there. And, uh, one of the things that I noticed was, uh, we had two nine elevens. Yeah, but th this is common in, in this here to just single out that verse because there's two actions. Okay. It doesn't well, I, I'm just, 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 just something that I noticed. I mean, what, our, what I was thinking on. Here is the three sons. The son either directly mentioned or implied by the word he. Okay. Right? The child or whatever. Um, in this one, uh, 10, we have the three angels messages repeated. So this would be the fourth thing, the whole verse itself. Right. Would that make sense to people? Hmm. Because here you're going to have the woman. She's going to make haste. Run. And show. What is she going to show? Now, all of these things are three steps in order for her to tell her husband about the angel. Okay, but the problem is, you just asked the right question. What is she going to show? Right. 
because she can't show the angel. But she can give she can give confirmation that this was the angel that appeared before her. Well, that's how I understand it. Right. Now, now, really, the whole thing is she's going to, the woman is going to show her husband that the man who appeared unto me came. It's the same same man came to me, right? But that's the angel. And so if we're going to just put it, try to put it into this. Here we have these three steps that lead to the confirmation of the angel's message in that sense. All right. Does that, that seem fair enough? I think it's direct. Okay. So then we're going to have Manoah is going to arise. And he's going to do, well, he's going to go after the woman. He's going to follow his wife. Yeah. And and he's going to rise, he's going to go to the man and he's going to say. Right? So these two kind of go together. Um because it's going to also have these three step, steps, right? Okay. He's going to rise. Uh he's going to go and he's going to ask ask right and and what is his asking because that's really the ultimate uh, verb there <clears throat> his ask art thou the man that spakest unto the woman okay so he's going to ask of the angel. Right. Right. Okay. Then we come to, to uh, verse 12. This is all just. Or, or do, we, do we have the response of the angel? Okay. Um, yeah. So we'll put the I am here. Right. That's not first angel's message. Or, you know, that's the I am. Okay. And, and I, I would take those two verses together if we're going to talk about uh, the angel's message and asking of the angel and the response. So this is all the confirmation of the three angels' messages. So again, you're going to have like the one, two, three. Okay. Okay. And then in verse 12, and Manoach said, now let their thy words come to pass how shall we or what what shall be the manner of the child and what shall be his work okay so how would we place this here <clears throat> this is again minoic asking But he wants to understand what is to occur with the child even before the child is born. Now, 
another way we could look at this, uh, we could put the child here again as number four because that's, you know, the son. I'm going to do it this way. Like that. Because okay. we, we have this child mentioned four times. And then this here goes together as showing that this is the history of 9-11, right? Because this is dealing with the, the mighty angel of Revelation 18 coming down. Okay, so this is helpful, right? Doing it this way? Yes. Okay. If not asked, we learn a little bit of English. Well, not very well, because you're not really following the rules, but. Well, it's easier to do this than it would be to do Russian. I guess I should do it this way instead. Uh, 14, 16. So do it like that. Okay, and we're gonna do, what time is it? Uh, we've got uh, 7.37. I guess, what, yeah, so yeah, we got about 20 minutes. It's 8.37 here. Okay, so we're not gonna get this done obviously today, but we okay, can start. So why are we skipping 13? Because it's the center verse, and I'm not, I'm matching up verses before verse 13 and verses after verse 13. Okay. All right. Now, um, and maybe what we should do here is we should do this differently again. Because um, what I want to find is the verses that line up with these verses. So this is going to be a little bit more difficult. So I'm, I'm not necessarily going to. So we have 12 verses at the at the beginning and 12 at the end. Um, is there anything that we can match up with verse one of those last 12 verses? Well. Okay, the let's if we if we tear this apart in the way that you're asking, mm -hmm. uh, if we looked at verse 14, because here they are he Christ is giving them the instruction about diet. Mm -hmm. So verse 14 lines up with both verse 7 and verse 4. Because they're instructions to the woman. Correct. Okay. So 14 lines up with 7 and 4. Okay, so before we, we draw these out here, so, so what we're trying to do is, is we're taking this first part as the structure. This is the, the structure of the first half of the chiasm. Right. And we're not saying that we're going to be able to match them verse for verse, right? We're, we're going to be able to match these concepts. Um, now we have the child mentioned four times. We know that there's this Na Nazarite vow uh, that's being in, given to the uh, this message about how the wife is supposed to act. Right. So in verse four is going to be told what she should do. She shouldn't drink wine or strong drink. And also in verse seven. Right. But then. Um, and, and then. in. Um, so when in verse seven, it says the child shall be a Nazarite of, 
uh, to God from the womb to the day of his death, then Manoah is going to entreat the Lord. And, um, and then the angel of the Lord is going to come to, he's going to hearken to the voice of Manoah, but he's going to come again to the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah is not with her, right? Right. And then uh, the woman is going to be given these instructions. Um, or actually, Angel Manoah is going to be given these instructions, right? So she's going to go get her husband. Manoah is going to be brought, and the angel of the Lord will be there, right? And he will give these instructions specifically regarding uh, the woman, right? In verse 14. Correct. You're going to have uh, in 3, 7, and 14 that these are all instructions to the woman because she's going to have a son, right? That's going to be a Nazarite. So would this be the three angels messages to the church in some way? Exactly. Yeah. So when we get to um, the directions that are given to Manoah, he's going to be told about, the woman in verse 14 so we got uh so so verse 14 is going to answer to three and seven is that how we're looking at it okay verse three is the promise are you tying verse three and verse four together yeah well verse three and four are tied together yeah so you got the promise of a son and then she's going to be given her directions, right? There isn't specific directions given regarding the son. No. Right. And there's not specific instructions being given really to Manoak either. No, just to the woman. So the woman is given these instructions because of this promised son. Right. Okay. And, and then, but it, it, I mean, it, and it says that he will be a Nazarite in verse five. But it doesn't, it doesn't give directions regarding him on how he is to keep this vow. Right. So when uh, Manoah is given these directions, first he's given the directions regarding the woman. Right. So he's not he's not specifically given directions regarding the sun there right right um so do we have any directions specifically regarding the sun regarding samson in any of this other than that he's going to be a nazarite no okay okay so we don't in this case we don't have how he's supposed to live. We assume that because we know the Nazarite vow includes that. Right? Okay. Um, so when, when in, in verse 12, Manoah had asked, how shall we order the child and how shall we do unto him? The angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware, right? He doesn't directly answer the question. He says, she may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing of all that I command her, let her observe. So, so if, if the woman represents the church and Manoah represents the message um basically that the church inherited from the Millerite movement, right? That's how we're understanding this. Thought that was the assumption. Yeah. Well, yeah. Continue. So, so when we're, we're trying to, when we're trying to understand how to put this on the line, we can see that this is a, repeat of the message that it's referring back always because this is going to be about samson and this is 
the preamble to Samson's birth, right? Right. And with Samson's birth, this would be a zoom into the time of the end, would it not? That is, this whole thing is a zoom into 9-11 in a retrospective, and we could even say 1989 maybe, um, but that history from 1989 to 9-11, that's what I'm referring to. Um, because Samson's not going to be born during that period. He's going to be born at 9-11 or, or after 9-11. If we understand, yeah, we're, we're still looking at Samson as the July 18th message, right? Well, he's more than the July 18th message, right? Because because we haven't really addressed exactly what Samson is here in in when we're when we're trying to draw this on a line yet. Okay, we know that he's he's more than just the July 18th message, but he he is connected. To it. But here we have. Um, yeah, and it, it depends how we look at this. That's that's so this analysis is, is is important. But we can see the first, second, and third angels' messages are men mentioned. Um, but the woman, the church, is going to um, embody those messages in the arrival of the fourth, as is Manoah, because the woman's going to haste, run, and show, and Manoah is going to rise, go, and ask of the angel. And then he's going to ask about the child, right? In verse um, 12, right? And then we have the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. So we're going to put that as the center of the chiasm. And that's what we have to decide. It, I mean, if we were going to guess where we put that, in, in the sense we're, we're just going to try something, where would we guess to put the chiasm? Uh, in the middle. Yeah, well, we put the center of the chiasm in the middle. So what's the middle of this chiasm? Or is that 13, I believe. Yeah, so it's 13. But where 12, is, where is it's that like between our, 12 and 13. Yeah, but where is our time, is what I'm saying. In our time, where are we putting the center of this chiasm? Mm. Right, so... I mean, we have to put it somewhere. Right? It's, it's going to be somewhere in time. So there is some kind of chiasm that exists in time. Because if, if this is a chiasm, it either is, I mean, a chiasm can represent um, the end and the beginning, both point to the center, right? Right. It doesn't mean that the, that these events happen uh, all chronologically. That is, you could have the first twelve verses lead up to the center, and then all the chiasm does at the end, the other verses, is is show what the center is. It gives information regarding the center. Doesn't mean that it necessarily follows after in in chronological time, because this is a literary chiasm, not a chronological chiasm. And so the things at the end of the chiasm give you information about things at the beginning of the chiasm, how to understand them. That's why they would write a chiasm. So if this, is, if this is written in a chiasm, it's the, 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 the second half is illustrating the first half. It's, it's, it's a type of repeat and enlarge, but it's just done in a mirror. Right? That, that's what a literary chiasm is. That's the purpose of it. So, so that's where we're going to have to when we when we when we go tomorrow. Well, not tomorrow, Sunday. We're going to have to look at this in more detail regarding the second half. But at least we have the first half here, and and there's probably ways that we could refine this. I mean, obviously, we could add a lot more detail. But mostly what we are trying to do is write these out so we can match these up. So the verses aren't going to match just in reverse order. You wouldn't take verse 14 uh, and necessarily, I mean, I, in this case, I think we would, um, because it's going to be the answer to the asking, right? But 
but we're not going to go all along and just look at verse 14 matches, verse 12, verse 15 matches, verse 11, right? You understand what I'm saying? Yes, I understand. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes things do work out sort of like that. I mean, there is a literary chiasm in the story of the flood. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they in somewhat, not verse for verse, but, I mean, there's an exact mirror of, uh, of the story. So the story can be written completely in a mirror. Um, and that's what we're trying to do here. So we're trying to see if there's a literary chiasm that fits. That we could be completely wrong about it being a chiasm, right? So just because we think we're analyzing whether it's a chiasm or not, we, we can't force something in. It should fall into place once we look at the second half of it. Well, you have to analyze it to be able to determine that. You just, at the point, we're just theorizing that it is. Yeah. Now, um, so just James topic. So we're going to leave this here. I want to look at something here. And just talking about theorizing. So this is going to be, um, this is Joanne's um, notes from her presentation on Sabbath. So. I don't know. Did anybody here listen to Joanne's presentation on Sabbath? I did not. No, I was unable. I was there. I listened to it. Okay. Rosanna was there. Okay. So when I look at, at this presentation, so this is uh, December 10th, 2022. Um, Joanne is going to present um, some spirit of prophecy quotes regarding uh, speculation, right? So that's why I bring this up. Speculation, theory, conjecture, surmising, supposition, hypothesis, guess, right? So these are definitions or words that are related to speculation. So, so you can see all of these, these words here, and she's going to give these definitions of them. And this is going to be based upon um, a statement, statements in the spirit of prophecy regarding this. Um, the first one is Review and Herald, March 22, 1892. It is not for you to know the times and the seasons. And um, so this is from the Ellen G. White Bible Commentary, and it's reprinted in the Review and Herald or it's printed from the Review and Herald, March 22nd, 1892. So she's going to be addressing that uh, and preach. So this is where it says, preach the simple gospel, not startling speculations. Um, so they're going to deal with what speculations are. Um, and, you know, the question I have is, when we start to study God's word in this way, are we speculating? I, I don't think so. I mean, it's, it's experimental at best. Okay. Uh, I don't think it's a, a, a speculation because you're not publishing anything at this point. You're just trying to figure it out. You're, 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 you're trying to find that key that you need to break the code. Okay. So I don't think there's anything wrong with speculations themselves. That is theories or conjectures. Now, surmising, I mean, can be related to it because that has to do with suspicion or the thought or imagination of that something may be of which there is no certain or strong evidence, right? Um, but right. Here, Ellen White's talking about startling speculations. So, I mean, first is, you, you, you know, we need to understand what that is uh, because uh, we're, we're studying God's word and anytime we, anytime you do any thinking, you have to, in some ways, speculate. I mean, you don't just stop there. And definitely, you wouldn't want to just have startling speculations. But the idea of a theory 
a speculation, a doctrine or scheme of things which terminates in speculation or contemplation without a view to practice. Um, so that would be a speculation, right? Um, a guess formed on a supposed possibility or probability of a fact or on slight evidence. Now, if you end there with a guess, I mean, because most of most of my thinking, you know, is you you know the something and then you examine it, right? So, in order to understand God's word, we need to need to examine it, because God's word is not based upon the uncertainty of human theory or conjecture, right? We need something solid. Now, this has been my argument against conspiracy theories. Because what are conspiracy theories? Are they based upon solid evidence? Never. No. No. Now, there are conspiracies that exist. So we shouldn't misunderstand the idea that that there when you, you talk about conspiracy theories, you're not saying that conspiracies don't exist, because conspiracies do exist. But a conspiracy theory is a belief in a conspiracy in which you have no real evidence. You might have circumstantial evidence. You might have some things that seem to fit together. But the word theory actually explains it. Right. Yeah, so we can see it, it would be a conspiracy speculation. Right? It's a speculation regarding about something. Yeah, until you have hard evidence, it it can be speculation. I mean, or it is speculation. To well, until it's opinion. until it's proven. I mean, until it's proven, right? So, you know, a, a conspiracy theory would be something like man didn't go to the moon. You know, and and in order to have this, you would have to believe that all of the evidence that man went to the moon is is just part of a conspiracy. So it. And, and conspiracy theories are hard to disprove because any evidence that's brought against it, you just that's right. you just say, well, that evidence is faulty. Now, um, and and with the vaccine, for instance, um, you know, we found that a lot of the the conjectures or guesses or theories regarding the vaccine have proved to be true, such as it came from the lab in Wuhan, right? And it was part of experiments that were done on, on the vaccine or on the virus, right? So the virus came from Wuhan, COVID came from Wuhan, is, is right now, I wouldn't say it's necessarily proven, but it is, it is much more likely than it came from nature, right? Because they don't have any, any viruses in any animals that they've collected uh, that match that virus right? can, can we say we use words like coincidences <laughs> because we've we've got a, a, a hopper load of coincidences well, um, okay. well, for what you mean by some of the theories that we have okay so it depends what you mean by a coincidence a coincidence just means well, two things that happen together right I like the actual meaning of the word coincidence so you have an incident and something's coincident that is, two things that are not related occur, right? Now, I don't think we actually have coincidences in, in, exactly. in the negative sense of things, uh, because we actually have things that are so highly improbable that they would be designed. And, and I've used before as an example, I know I'm going to go a bit over time here, um, but I've used it as an example before, back in uh, 1973, uh, I threw a penny in the hot springs in Jasper. And if I, you know, and I, I didn't scratch my initials on it, but it, pretend I scratched my initials upon that, that penny. And let's say I was in Australia and I was talking to somebody about this penny that I had thrown in the well in 1973. And I happen to look down on the street and there's a penny, a Canadian penny. And I pick it up and it's from 1973 and it has my initials inscribed upon it. Now, would that be a coincidence? 
That is, could that happen by accident? No, it could not. Could not. What, what would I have to suppose about what happened there? It would have to, somebody would have to get in the well and take get that penny and bring it to that spot. Well, they, they could have found a 1973 Canadian penny because they may have heard me tell the story. The territories of the Americas were pretty much neglected. I'm hearing you. Okay, so, so they would have had to um, have heard me tell the story before and to play a joke upon me uh, you know, put this penny on the street and and purposely take me for a walk in that direction or something. I would not uh, suppose that that was that was not planned, right? Because that would not be able to happen by accident. Correct. It would be so highly unlikely. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that the odds are pretty high. Right, I agree. Yeah. So I, I'd have to be pretty suspicious that that it, it wasn't purposeful, right? And, uh, you know, so, I mean, I, I doubt it's going to happen. But, I mean, if it did, I would doubt that it was just a, a coincidence. Because it would be such a highly unlikely coincidence that I would have to, uh, I'd have to say that it was designed. That somebody was behind it, you know, because because I've told this story many times, right? So uh, about the penny. Um, so you know, so this is the thing when you have something that's so highly improbable that it 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 defies all odds as happening by chance. It obviously can't have happened by chance, right? You would have to say that there is some something behind it. And that's how we look at God's word, right? When we look at um, Christ coming and dying on the cross in 31 AD, you know, we don't, as Christians say, well, you know, that's just a coincidence that there was these prophecies written in the Bible. And, you know, now skeptics would say either it was by design, that is, the story didn't really happen. People just made it up from the Old Testament scriptures. Um, and so they... They put the, this sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy in a sense. They're expecting a Messiah. A guy came along, uh, pretended to be the Messiah. He got killed. His followers then, you know, made up stuff about his resurrection and et cetera, right? I mean, that's, that's generally the running theory for skeptics. The only problem that we have is so many of these things would not have been... Um, accepted by Jews, plus many of them, them would not have been fully understood until much later. And we can deal with all the time prophecies that we can analyze them and recognize this structure that points to Christ as the Messiah that could not have been made up. So they, they couldn't have made up the details at the time. They didn't have enough information to do that. So, so, um, so there's some good things about this, this study that Joanne did. Um, and one is it's, it's pointing to an argument that I've made right from the beginning of time setting. Um, and, and especially even before that regarding conspiracy theories. So, so this to me is mostly talking about conspiracy theories, though it is talking about time setting. So this here where it says... Um, there will never again be a message for the people of God that will be based on time. We are not to know the definite time either for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or for the coming of Christ. So after we made this November 9th, 2019 prediction, I, I wrote a paper in which I, I started with this addressing what Ellen White says about time settings. And I made the argument that we cannot ignore what she said. That is, we have to accept this uh, unequivocally, that is, there never will again be a message for the people of God that will be based upon time. Do we accept that statement? Um, somewhat. Well, in the I mean, context it, it of what depends she's on talking, who you're asking. Well, well, in the context of what she's talking about, 
We will not know a definite time either for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or for the coming of Christ. So, so this, in that context, I'd have to say yes. So, so we can't know when Jesus is going to come back. We also can't know when the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out as far as predicting that. Now, can we know about it afterwards? I'm sorry, can we know about what? That the Holy Spirit was poured out afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Why would, I mean, you'd see it, wouldn't you? Yeah, and we know that Ellen White says again and again, I've been warning, warning regarding to time setting. So, so I argued that we weren't time setting back in 2018. And I made that argument based upon um, the fact that what she says about time setting, we weren't, we weren't doing. That is, we weren't predicting these events on the big line, that these were internal events. And the reason that we ended up with time in the message was a message for us to expose error. And that error primarily, how did we end up in time setting in the first place? Where did that come from? Paul Mando, wasn't it? In 2012, right? So Parminder introduced time, time setting into the movement in 2012, in March of 2012. And it was readily denounced as fanaticism by Jeff. And he wrote a paper against time setting because Jeff has dealt with time setting his whole time as an Adventist. So have I. I've always been opposed to time setting. So I'm still opposed to it. And I was opposed then, and I've been opposed all the time. Right? That the time that we have... Now, the question is, could we predict external events? Now, these external events, are any of these um, the definite time, either for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or for the coming of Christ? Or for any other promise of special significance? Because we're not going to know the definite time for those either. So was July 18th a, a transgression of this, this statement? So it's something for us to think about. Because if we just took this statement and we just, we applied it to any amount of time, that would be any element of time. Is this not the December 6, 2020 declaration? What do you mean by that? Isn't she agreeing with the declaration on December 6, 2020? Wasn't that their message? that we were wrong in using time, okay? So, so if that's the case, and, and I've, I've made the argument that we weren't wrong in using time because um, it's not for us to know the times or the seasons which God has put into his own power, right? Which the Father has put into his own power. Was that true in October 22nd or in, you know, in 1844? Was this true? This statement in the spirit of prophecy, which is from the Bible. Was that true in 1844? It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. No, it was not true. Not, not, not at that time. Really? I think it's it was it was true then. Well. Yeah, to a certain perspective, I suppose. Well, no, it's it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put into his own power. That was true in 1844. It's well, not, they, was talking right. about, they was talking about Jesus' second coming. What? Right. So could they predict the second coming of Christ? No, you can't. No. Okay. But were they wrong in finding the end of the 2300 days? No. No, they weren't. Okay, right. 
So, so their mistake was in the event that they were predicting, but not in the use of time. Right, right. Right. So, so that's what we, that's the question that needs to be answered in this analysis of our history. Right. So, um, So this, so this is something that um, I think that the movement has to address. This not this weekend, but the weekend following, we need to address what's in Joanne's paper. Because if we can't understand this correctly, I mean, if we're going to ignore statements in the spirit of prophecy, that would be pretty dangerous. And we also can't manipulate statements in the spirit of prophecy to suit our own our own thinking. And so the way that the December 6, 2020 declaration, that committee or whatever it was, the way that they addressed this is they just threw the baby out with the bathwater. Theodore, I know you done said this, but I was going to repeat it this way. It was like... Um, they was right about his coming. They was just wrong about where he was coming to. But they were wrong also to predict the time of his coming. Yeah. Right. That is, they had to take statements in the Bible and not apply them correctly. But we also know if it's true that it's not for you know to the times or the seasons now, it was also true in 1844. Because Jesus is saying this or 1844. So, so we need to understand these statements in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And I think that's what the movement has to try to address. One of the things they have to try to address. But was there a purpose behind them getting the date? I think it was to get people ready. Yeah. But, but they were transgressing the plain statements of scripture regarding time setting for the second coming of Christ. I'm just saying, if it's, if it's true, it is not for you know the times of the seasons which the Father has put into his own power. If that was true in the time of Christ, and Ellen White applies it to our time, it was also true in 1844. That's all I'm saying. And so we have to be quite careful when we take these statements and we make an application of them. Because we could be undermining Adventism completely. Right? If we're going to apply it to July 18th or to Collins prediction or something, wherever we're going to apply it, we have to apply it across the board. Right? So that means we have to apply it correctly. Because if we apply it incorrectly now the conclusion is we would and we're going to be consistent we would have to renounce uh adventism correct yep yeah so that's, that's right you'd have to renounce adventism if you did that yeah so you can't just take this statement of jesus and only apply it now and not apply it in 1844 and if you apply it in 1844, you have to apply it in the correct context, because if you apply it in the incorrect context, then you reject Adventism. That would be, have to be your conclusion. Okay, so sorry about going over time, but let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the study this morning. We know that we have much to learn. And... Um, at this time, Lord, we lift up this movement in prayer. We know the need that we have to understand your word. We know the hearts and the desires that each of us have to know truth. You also know our frailty. You know our lack of understanding, our lack of wisdom, our lack of Christ-like character. You know our impatience with others and our excusing of our own actions. And you know, Lord, that um, you know each heart, you know what you have been trying to teach us 
and the lessons we are unwilling to learn. So we just pray, Lord, that you can help each of us as we approach the end of this year, as we make plans to invite others into this discussion, um, that your spirit can work upon all hearts, especially our own, and that you can show us how to draw close to you so that we can draw close to one another. Be with us throughout this day until we meet again. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.